So I'm here in Belfast at Gary's Barber Shop with uh, Mr. Gary Machin of the Barber Council. Gary is also a barber shop owner and I'm here today to interview Gary to find out about the Barber Council and his experience as a barber. So I'm going to start, as I always start, Gary, by asking what was your inspiration and motivation to become a barber and tell me where you started from the very beginning. Well, from my point of view, it was a family thing. Um, third generation barber, um, followed my dad into the trade, which, very proud. Wasn't, I will admit, wasn't my first choice at the beginning, but it's turned out very, very well and you know, I love the trade. I absolutely love the trade. Um, indentured apprentice at 15, left school, um, started work in the barber shop around 12, 13 years old as a, a Saturday boy. Um, when, I, when I actually got into the trade, I, I realised very quickly that, you know, customer service, that was the thing, you know, um, it was always, uh, you know, I, I couldn't, my dad, the work ethic was, and the customer service was the most important. Um, from there, did my apprenticeship, three years, and then two years uh, improver. Uh, qualified as, as, a, as a barber. Um, 32 years now, it's coming up to, which, you know, I can't, I can't believe myself. I don't know where the years have gone. Um, got into teaching. Uh, education is my passion now. Um, still stand behind the chair, Monday to Friday, Saturday, uh, if I'm not teaching or, or doing things like this. Um, got into teaching purely and simply to take control of our own education within the salons. We have six shops and got all family in, got two brothers in the job as well. Um, and it, from, from an education point of view, we just wanted to make a difference, if you like. We, we wanted to... Uh, get out there and and control their own training really from start to finish so that's why I, I got into into the actual educational side as well okay perfect well you've answered uh, my next question which was uh, how much time do you actually spend on the barber shop floor because it's important for people to know that as the chairman of the barbering council you actually understand the work and environment of the barber shop, the trials and tribulations. So. Oh, most <laughs> most definitely. I mean, I, I don't think I'm a great believer in, uh, especially educators. They should be current. You know, they should be working barbers. They should be working hairdressers, because I don't think if if you're, I hate to use the word preaching or, or teaching, you've got to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk, really, because. Um, people who've, who've gone from education into education or, you know, they're not actually on the shop floor anymore, they aren't real, you know, it's simple as that, simple as that. If I'm not teaching or, you know, working for, um, you know, I educate for, for quite a few different companies, work for awarding organisations, um, I'm behind the chair, simple as that. You know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday at least is, is what I do in, in, the, in the salon, you know, because they are our busiest days. But... If we've got no other commitments or our own academy, because we teach, you know, we've got our own academy as well, we're actually behind the chair. And, and you know, that's very and, and really, really important to us. Okay, so for me, that qualifies you. Yeah. So the next question is, how was you uh, elected, how was you given this gig, if you like, to be the chairman of the Barbering Council? Very, very honoured. Uh, everything that's ta kind of happened within my career, um, whether it be teaching, um, writing standards, educating, it's always been something that I haven't chased. It's people have, have kind of asked, you know, it's kind of um, your experience speaks for itself, I suppose. But um, from a, a point of view of the, the council, I've been registered barber since 19, uh, 1997 where at that point it was you were a registered hairdresser. Uh, really great advocate of, of not regulating the industry, but improving the industry. Um, so when the actual Barber Council was formed, um, I kindly got asked onto the council 
and then from there I was you know was asked to to chair it which you know really really great honor for me you know um from from a point of view of 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 the council it was um you know it was what can i say it was uh, out of the blue you know it was just i was blown away okay so you were elected it's not a, a kind of role you yeah. made yourself so it was based on a oh, number yeah. of professionals putting you in this position yeah we have to be clear on all of this yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay perfect and can you clearly define what the barbering council is because a lot of people are still unclear right. and they should be very clear based on what you're trying to achieve yeah uh, the barber council is or was um set up in 2014 uh, we've been running now for two years then the hair council which is if i give a, a little brief history was set up in 1964 it was backed by Parliament, it, so we have got an, a bill there that we are the official register for hairdressers and barbers. Although years ago when it was set up, barbers weren't in the actual name, so now it's actually called the Hair Council. And the registrar, our registrar, which is Sally Stiles, had to go to Parliament and say, can we have a separate uh, barber council? And that was we had to go to the Home Secretary for that and he agreed. So in 2014, the Barber Council was formed. And the Barber Council, um, from you know, our point of view is, it's a, it's a council formed for um, all the stakeholders, if you like, within the industry. So uh, the people that are on the council are, we've got distributors, uh, manufacturers, barbers, mainly um, we've got educators we've got um, all organizations all organizations represented on there so we've got the uh, National Hairdressers Federation uh, British Barbers Association and men's hairdressing Federation you know so everybody that's got a, a, a stake in the industry is represented on the council and we're all there for one particular reason which is purely and simply to represent the the industry and improve you know and that is it there's no underlying um you know what's what's in it for us it's a non-profit organization and it's the only statutory body that rep that can officially represent the hair and barbering industry um to parliament you know we are we've got a, a parliament's a government um if you like stamp of approval to represent the industry so you're just doing something for the greater good of the barbering community yeah, yeah. to lift up the standards, uh, try and get rid of the not so good barbers, get, I don't know, get the paid the money that you're worth and not have people. To the, the, the one and only thing, uh, you know, I, I get asked this all the time is it's to be, I mean, for, I love this industry. Uh, you know, I absolutely, obviously I live for it because it, it takes up all of my time, but from from our point of view we are not classed as a profession simple as that you know we are not a regulated registered profession and to me that is just ridiculous you know from a point of view of what we what we actually give to the industry from from the industry to the economy um you know everybody uses ha either hairdresser or barber generally unless you like yourself and do it yourself but you know, we are there, you know, in, we're on every high street, you know, everybody knows and everybody expects us to be qualified and registered, but sadly we aren't. Okay. And tell me, what is this um, hashtag that's going around, get registered campaign? Tell me about this. Well, that's more for, obviously we need, we need members. We need, at the moment, we're a, a voluntary registered organization. So we want it to be mandatory uh, for, from an industry point of view. The hashtag get registered uh, campaign is, it is to, to make barbers and hairdressers aware, but also the public. We want to come from a consumer point of view as well. If you go into any barber shop or any hairdressers and you talk to the clients and they'll say, you know, we aren't a regulated industry. Anybody can buy a pair of clippers, a razor, chair, 
you know, mirror, they can set up the cells. They're gobsmacked, absolutely gobsmacked. And for me, that's, it's wrong. It, it, it is wrong. You couldn't do it in any other industry. And, and from my point of view, uh, it's almost, um, you, we, we need to um, educate the consumer, if you like, because they just take it for granted that we're all qualified and we know what we're doing. And unfortunately, there's a lot out there. There are, you know, we, we're not naming names, but there's some very, very poor tradesmen out there. And I, I, I use tradesmen loosely, okay. you know. Cool. And tell me, what does the £42 registration fee cover exactly? From, from, from a point of view of the, of the money, uh, £42 gets you, um, for one, it proves that you are professional, you know, you are educated to, the, to a certain level. Um, you can use, I know this, this isn't everybody's bag, but, you know, it, it proves that we are something. You can use the, the uh, initials after your name, so you state state registered barber or state registered hairdresser. Um, from from my point of view, it gives us a voice. It, if if the whole industry joined together and pulled in one direction, um, we would have a voice in Parliament. Whether it be for minimum wage, you know, any controls on tax. The the thing with the industry at the moment is it's underrepresented in in Parliament. And we've just uh, had uh, an all-party uh, parliamentary committee formed. So now they're actually sitting up and taking notice that we are there and we have got a voice. And that is the most important thing for me. But other, other than that as well, we have a quarterly magazine so you can have your work um, and what you do um, showcased. Um, we go on the website, you can go on. It isn't a good barber's guide or a good hairdresser's guide, but the consumer can go on there and see who is registered. You just put your postcode in, and you can ha you can see who's who's had the 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 um, uh, recognition to be a state registered uh, barber or hairdresser. Um, we also get um, different kinds of of uh, um, um, insurance uh, policies. You can you can actually get. Um, uh, Discount. discount on it. Um, there's also um, you're able to access uh, training and store cards. Um, you can. The, the main thing is with it is uh, a lot of the time is actually belonging, belonging to a professional body. Um, we can, you know, we say it's forty two pound. If we do. Um, um, uh, what do we call it? Um, I think it's I think it's three pound fifty now. Um, if you do a direct debit, it actually works out at thirty eight pounds or something like that. But what you've got to remember is, if this does take off, and you know when it actually becomes mandatory, um, that that hopefully that will that will drop. That 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 actual price won't increase. It will drop, and we hopefully can um, put. Um, some training in place. We can put. Uh, you've got a helpline as well. Uh, you get a certificate. You get a, a license to practice. You know, a little um, card to, with 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 your um, um, qualifications on. So, you know, it, there is really really great uh, benefits to it as well. Okay, so it's a small level registration fee. Yeah, yeah. For what you get. Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, when you look at it at three pound fifty, I mean. It's a pint, isn't it? Too cheap. Yeah. Okay, so what do you propose to do to get state registration made compulsory? Because right now, I believe, after traveling all around the world and to America quite a lot, we're actually laughing stock that uh, state registration is not mandatory. I totally agree. I mean, we get guys, I, I do all the shows. Um, we, we've got our own academy and from a, um, you know, Britain is best kind of attitude, which I think our industry is fantastic. Um, we are, like you say, a laughing stock, really, because everywhere else in, you know, in Europe, Australasia, you know, the States, everybody's registered, aren't they? They have to have a license to practice. Um, we get guys coming up to us and, you know, offering their qualifications and by law, really, 
we don't have to do that. We, you know, I think it comes down to employers as well. I think I think they need to up their game by, you know, insisting on um, quality. I don't think that is as as much as a problem as people who who actually set up and work for themselves. You know, they're almost below the radar, if you like. Um, we did a, a survey throughout the country and not a lot of local councils, you don't even have to register with the council. You know, it's, um, it's got to the point where you should do, but most don't. And unless you actually get to the point where, with, especially with the councils, uh, the local council and local bylaws, people aren't even adhering to local bylaws or even, um, you know, qualifications wise, I think we've got to go from a health and safety point of view because uh, from our our surveys and you know our consultations it's contamination cross contamination reusing towels not wearing gloves for shaving i mean these are mandatory you know the the the, the actual public expect this but obviously it isn't happening and you know for instance wearing gloves while we're shaving any shaving that means facial neck skin fades should be wearing gloves any any risk of blood you should be wearing gloves not only because of you but for the client as well for the consumer you know they don't know you you don't know them as well as we'd like to you know sometimes but that's been there for 15 years that's been in the actual national occupational standards for 15 years and we've still got people using cutthroat razors or open razors without using gloves i mean it's unacceptable you know, completely and utterly unacceptable. Using the same blade for multiple clients it should be new blade for every client. You know, colouring shouldn't do anything under under sixteen. You know, using manufacturer's instructions. This is happening all over the country, and for for some reason, either people choose not to do it, or you know, a bit naive. But we've got to get the message out there, and you know, as part of the council. We're not preaching. We just want to raise the actual standards, the good working practice, if you like. Share good working practice. Anybody can come anywhere. You know, come to our salons. We'll come out to uh, educational organisations. We need to get that message out there. You know, it's it's simply short and simple. Is we need that message getting out there. You know. For sure. Well, I've I've got something I'd like to add. I think the state registration of £42 is too cheap because after listening to you, the work that needs to be done to get this actually done is not going to happen with 42 quid, especially with the numbers that are registering. Yeah. Also, I think you need to spend a lot of money on an advertising campaign. We're here, it's a Sunday. Gentlemen, read the Sunday newspaper. You should have ads in the newspaper making the public aware yeah, of this yeah. and then by public demand people will come into the barber shops ask if you're state registered you will then tell them no and they'll pivot and they'll go into somewhere which is state registered and all the barbers can actually get paid the money that they're worth because yeah. when you've got the We're back street barbers charging four and five pound they just think you're too expensive they don't understand that you've got the correct blades you've got barber side you've got all the regulation things and these things cost money and it can't be done for four and five quid correct so yeah. that's my Larry the barber man's uh, little bit he wants to say sir you're <laughs> converted <laughs> <laughs> okay so tell me the difference between the barbering council and other organizations because I think there is a lot of mix-up between yeah, the barber yeah. council and the BBA that the, the I mean, you, you've picked one out there, you know, the BBA. What we try to do is, if you imagine um, you've got the National Hairdressers Federation, you've got the British Barbers Association, the Men's Hairdressing Federation, and, and there's loads more. I mean, they, they, they're popping up all over the place, aren't they? Um, we are an overarching, if you like, um, over all these organisations. We're non-profit. We all give, all, all people on the council give the time for, for free, which is, I think it's important. I mean, we're in Belfast here today. I'm based in uh, the northwest of, of England. Um, we're traveling to get that message out there. But more importantly is 
the Barber Council, if we pull all in one, in one direction, I'm all for organisations representing certain parts of the industry. But from our point of view, the, um, the Barber Council has representatives of these organisations on the council. And I think from an industry point of view and from a public point of view, they, you know, people are kind of, well, I'll, I'll go with those or I'll pick those, I'll pay the £25 or I'll pay the £100 or, you know, I can't be, and I understand that, we can't be, we can't be affiliated to every organisation. But from a Barber Council organisation, we are the only statutory body that is representing the barbering and hairdressing industry through Parliament. Um, you know, from um, Parliament point of view, we are the, if you like, the go-to organisation. If they, if they want a, uh, a particular um, uh, rep on, on something that is happening in industry, they come to us or you know, our affiliations to actually what is happening or what do we need to do. Now, if we all join and push in that right direction, in one direction, you've got a, you know, a bigger voice, haven't we? You know, simple as that. There's no ulterior motive. It isn't a money-making, uh, you know, what we've, what we've had said to us in the, in the past is, you know, it's, we're just taking people's money. It's nothing to do with that whatsoever. Granted, all these organisations that are below, uh, you know, on that level, they are there to push a certain wear, aren't they? You know, they're a, they're a commercial uh, entity. What I can say about, you know, if anybody's watching this is, if you, if you think of the Barber Council, we are representing all those organisations as well. You know, we've got people on there that are putting their voice forward. So from their members' point of view, they are getting heard. So, you know, from a, a barber council point of view and the hair council point of view, it's for the good of the industry, nothing else. Okay, perfect. And in closing, how can barbers get involved with the barbering council? Where can we find you on the various social medias and what is your website? Right, so um, the barber council is, uh, if you like, um, on par with the hair council. If you, if, you, if you Google hair council, it'll take you straight to our website. At the moment it's been, um, it, we've, we've got a, a, a company at the moment who's uh, renewing the, the website, is, is rebuilding the website. But um, if you go onto the website, we've got our own barber page on there. You can go to wherever um, registered barbers are. There's the home page there as well. Um, we, we are actually at all the shows. You know, we, we try to get every, to most shows through up and down the country. We have a stand there. We, uh, on social media, uh, from the office, uh, Ali Agius, she actually deals with all our social media. So we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you know, all that, all that, all those uh, social medias are covered there. At where? Well, at, what's the, at, at, at Hair Council. At Hair Council. Yeah, okay. or at Barber Council. Okay. Um, the thing with, the, thing with the, the social media thing at the moment is um, it can be very, very good and it can be not so good, shall I say. We've had... Uh, People tend to, when, when, when we go on social media, you, you kind of get people going in there, throwing a hand grenade in and then walking away, don't you? You know, and we, we all have this in all our businesses. Um, unfortunately, we, we get some doubters. That's fine. You know, we, we try to address that. But from the hair council and barber council, we try not to put anything negative on there or reply to anything negative because you just get into a, a, a kind of a slanging match, really, you know, and it's unprofessional. So, you know, if you get in touch we will uh, get back to you and, and we will we will try to uh, accommodate everybody who gets there you know okay perfect Gary thank you very much for this interview I'm sure you've cleared up uh, you know closed a lot of doors of doubts in the barbering community's mind as to what the barbering council is all about and what you're trying to achieve after listening to this I'm sure people should know that it's for the greater good, it's for their well-being, the longevity of their business and obviously increasing their profits and flushing out the bad. So I thank you very much for this interview. Thank, thank you very much, Larry. You're welcome.